Hi everybody, I'm Arthur, I'm an alcoholic. Hi. I'm also an addict. Um, I do have experience with this work, um, the way that it's uh, laid out here. I continue to do the work today. Um, that's why I'm here. Um, I have a very small handful of people left to uh, make amends to, and I practice the latter steps uh, on a regular basis. Um, Mike, thanks for letting me share. <coughs> I didn't know what the step was on. I don't usually ask. I don't usually think it's any of my business to ask. If I am asking, it's usually because I want to plan. And um, I, there's nothing to plan for. It, 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 there's, there's my opinions, and then there's the work. And then there's the things that I've done. And I found out that the first part of that doesn't really have any weight which is my opinion. The work has to be talked about because it's the tes testimony of what happened to me. And um, there's what I'm doing to demonstrate it as proof. Um, this, this step is, is really um, one of the most profound um, that I've you know, and experienced and have been experienced with, and, and um, man, one of the greatest things that ever happened to me, and I can't take credit for it, like knowingly, consciously, at that time, taking my third step with my sponsor, I really didn't have any idea what I was getting into. Um, I just had like a surface understanding of, you know, the sense that what I had learned in step one and what I discovered in step two, I, by the time I got to this place with my sponsor, I was re I'd realized that, you know, or had a sense that there was something wrong. You know, there wasn't a clear understanding. There wasn't profound knowledge. There was now more evidence that was convincing that I'd come to the realization of with my sponsor's time and effort um, that I wasn't normal. That the way that I reacted to booze and to alcohol in general, to, to, to life was different. And that I had the first step ground, you know, the first step groundwork to kind of be the, you know, it was the basis of, the, of, of this. You know, had I not been convinced that I reacted differently when I drank, I wouldn't have never gotten here. I wouldn't be at a third step had I not realized that I was different. So thank God for sponsorship. Thank God for people who breathe and live this work that it, it's in them, you know, that my sponsor opened my eyes to something that never happened sitting at hundreds of meetings. It just never happened. I don't know why, it just didn't. So I got together with my sponsor when I got to this point and we'd spent, up until this point, I'd spent a lot of time reading and meeting with him in cars and parking lots and at his house and laundry mats and and uh and i did at laundry mats you know i he i call him up and and just be you know worked up over whatever i was worked up and and i would meet him and he it his life didn't stop if i hung out with him and which i did you know it was whatever he was doing be it hiking be it laundry be it cooking and um on a few occasions i spent time with him at the laundry mat folding his laundry <laughs> like, what the f are you kidding me? Like, I, I don't, I'm not here to fold laundry. Like, and it was really awkward and uncomfortable because I really didn't know him. I didn't know anything. I just knew that I was in pain and I, and I, and all, it was this fog of AA and sponsorship and this work that I'd now begun with him and these readings and, 
you know, him wanting to spend time with me and me not understanding why he would want to spend time with me, him befriending me and me being uncomfortable, him wanting to help me and me being misunderstood about his motives. Just a cloud. Literally, the, all I could do was just to walk and, um, and try to trust. And I think that had, it, had he not told me the truth about what he saw in me, I definitely would have ran. I would have ran for cover because he was really uninteresting and didn't have a tremendous amount of time at that point. And, you know, he wasn't a walking, you know, um, AA poster child as far as like, you know, you know, slammed with bumper stickers on his car and, you know, coins wrapped around his neck. Like he wasn't that guy. He, he wasn't, a, he wasn't any of those things. So in a traditional sense of coming into AA, the way that I had entered AA in what I believed would be the uh, parameters for picking a sponsor, he was none of those things. And it was all the things that I just mentioned. You know, somebody who had a lot of time and that's how I picked a sponsor. So he, he didn't do any of those things, but what he did do was he called me out on things. He, um, if I was being over, you know, oversensitive or or uh, demanding, or um, insecure, neurotic. Whenever I would bounce emotionally, he would he would point it out, and he would say, "You know, you're acting like an asshole today." Like, and then he would ask me what was wrong, and he would probe. And it was because of the courage that he had in asking those questions that I found faith that this might actually work. It was because of the no spin zone that he operated in. That's what I believed in. You know, I finally, I mean, he was more straightforward with me than anybody that I'd ever known in my life. You know, he um, would tell me that I was full of shit when I was full of shit. And he would help me to see that I would act that way because I was afraid. He promised that if I did the work and I stayed focused that I would get better. And um, I was petrified. I mean, I had no idea how much alcoholism had affected me on the levels that it did. And it was every level. I mean, I was sober at this point, six months, and afraid and suffering from depression and anxiety attacks and just a real emotional basket case, just layers upon layers of, of damage. Um, and um, I got together with him after a couple of months worth of reading and um, some, you know, many, <clears throat> many meetings and I took my third step and we were in his apartment and it was nothing uh, dramatic. We read the book. Um, I considered the three pertinent ideas. I prayed about the three pertinent ideas as best that I could. I contemplated whether or not I found them to be true. And I was convinced, I had doubts that were fear-based doubts, you know, they were self-centered doubts. This isn't going to work for me. I'm going to be the one guy this doesn't work for. Very, very self-absorbed. And the chances are, if you have those thoughts, um, you're just in the same place that I was in. And that's all it is. It's just that you're wrapped up in your own head. And you need that sponsor because you can't see it on your own. You can't walk it on your own because you're wrapped up in your own head. That is exactly what this whole step is about. It's about acknowledging the fact that you're broke. It's about trusting in somebody else. It's about letting go. 
And that's super, super hard when you've resolved yourself to the fact that you are your own solution to everything. <clears throat> don't wait. I don't, would suggest you don't wait for the feeling that it's all gone and you've now yielded and you're perfectly godlike. Probably not going to happen. You're not. I'm not. We're not. In that moment, it's not about that. It's simply about taking a new position on what's going to happen going forward. You are at a crossroad in the third step. You're either convinced that you suffer from alcoholism at this point, or at least potentially suffer from alcoholism, or you're not. You're either going to live the way that you lived, or you're going to change. Period. End of story. It's a decision to change. It's a decision to be better. It's a decision to, to walk towards God, not knowing if he's even really there, not having necessarily any tangible proof, blind. And had it not been for the things that I suffered that led me to be in the place that I came to, the pain, I probably wouldn't have decided that. The very best that I could do was say, okay. And we knelt down and I, you know, he grabbed my hand and I held his hand and I put my head down and it was awkward. And I was nervous. I was full of doubt. And we said the prayer. And I waited for the flash of light, and it didn't come. And I waited and looked for a tangible evidence that God was present. And he probably was. It's just that I lacked the ability to see it. And he told me to go buy a notebook. That was it. <clears throat> and he said, if you're really doing this, now you got to prove it. Now you got to demonstrate it. Write your inventory. And that was it. There's nothing more than that. And I wanted, and I felt like I had made a covenant, an agreement with God to do something different. That I had finally decided I wanted to be different. I was going to be different. I didn't know if it was going to work, but I was going to try. So I went out and I bought a notebook. Actually, I bought a three-subject notebook. And I brought it back, and he said, no. I said, a five-subject notebook. And I returned the three-subject notebook for a five-subject notebook. And I said, no, I, I can't possibly, there's no way I can possibly fill that notebook. I mean, it's five subjects. I've never filled a five-subject notebook with anything in my life. He said, you'll fill it. You'll fill several, probably. And every time I sat down to do inventory, at every turn, on my own, uninfluenced, unrequested, my own fruition, my own will, it was an act of that decision. It was a demonstration of that decision. It was me aligning my will with God's will. Trying to. Full of doubt. Full of fear. Doubtful the whole time. But I knew enough at this point that I didn't have the best ideas. And I knew that the decisions I'd made prior to this point in my life were not panning out. They were not working. I had to do something different. Or not. Try and go it alone. And the book talks about that. They suggest that, you know, uh, you go out and try some more controlled drinking. An old way of saying something to me, but very new for them at that time. Period. You know, there was... Uh, there was, uh, it was better that you understood how sick you were than to 
try with reservations. It was better that you were clear. And I just wasn't willing to go out and go back to where I had come from. So, turning point. You know, you literally are. You imagine yourself standing at the crossroads. It's a life and death errand. I don't use alcohol with control. I'd never use it casually. And when I do use it, it is complemented by a barrage of illegal street substances. There is nothing social about the way that I think about a drink. I drink for the effect. I drink to get ruined. I drink to run. I drink for many reasons. But ultimately, I'm drinking to escape wherever I am. And the fact that I don't have a couple of drinks and then go to sleep or stop, you know, and instead spend money that I can't afford to spend because I think it's a good idea to get an eight ball on top of that drink, instead spend a car payment that's supposed to be due in a couple days because I want to treat my friends or get laid. And I do that, even though I'm married. I do those things. I, I disregard and dishonor everything that's honorable and structured around me to get wherever I want to be at that moment. There's nothing social in that behavior. There's nothing reasonable. It's completely over the top and full of excess. And if I reflect on that long enough, honestly in prayer, with my sponsor pointing it out to me, reminding me, because my way of thinking is to deny all of those negative things or to justify them with something that's completely irrational and completely dishonest so that I don't have to be accountable for it. And if I don't have to be accountable for it, then I don't have to change. And that's what this step is about. It's about accountability. You can't do it unless you're being completely honest. They warn us in this step that in the very first sentence, we can only be defeated by dishonesty. You know, there are those two, there are those unfortunates who are completely incapable of being honest with themselves. They classify a certain group of people who abs actually cannot ever be entirely honest. Thank God I wasn't one of those. Yet. That I was capable of some honesty. But I know one thing is for sure. You absolutely, I, I, you can't do this work unless you're ready to change. Because I promise you, if you pass this third step and you do the work, you're going to change. You're not going to come out the backside the same person. I am not the same man that entered into that third step. Matter of fact, I didn't become a man until I took it. And began to understand what it meant to be that. To walk in that. To self-sacrifice. To stop robbing from others for the sake of my low self-esteem. You know, to steal, you know, emotional vampirism. Fly around and suck the life out of other people because I feel like shit. I don't do that anymore. Unless you're willing, and it says it in here, in the first page of how it works, the result was nil unless we, we let go Absolutely. Absolutely means entirely. It means everything. The crap you do to make yourself feel better from day to day, you've got to be willing to yield it. 
The good news is you don't have to yield it when you make your third step. The truth is you're incapable of making a yield like that even at that point of your third step. The further truth is, is that you're still incapable of it having written your fourth step. And to go further than that, you're still not capable of it even by the time you're doing your ninth step. The real truth is, is you haven't done shit. If you were capable of doing it, and I was capable of doing it, I wouldn't land in the seat in the first place. I wouldn't have needed God. So even on the back end of the ninth step work, even though I've got a head full of AA, and I know how to go out and finally say that I'm sorry, I'm still without power. My power still derives from God. It still derives back to my third step. Without him, I only have me. And my toolbox has always been the same. It's humiliating. I mean, it's humbling. It's really humbling to, 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 to process it and think about it. You know, I, I came in broken, so I make a third step decision. I write an inventory. I say my fifth step, six, seven. My ninth step list comes out of my eighth. Excuse me, my, my ninth step work comes out of my eighth step. Now I'm awake, spiritually, I'm awake emotionally. Still having to demonstrate the third step every time I go out to make an amends to somebody is another revalidation that I'm still in the game, that I'm still living in my decision, that I still want to change, that I'm proving that I still want to change because I'm willing to go out there and suck it up. At the end of the day, what we do is really about personal change and alignment with God. To go from being completely self-willed and self-centered and playing God ourselves, like it talks about with the director, to taking a back seat and letting God guide us through life. If you're like me, you'll kick and scream the whole way. You'll convince yourself that you still have answers, or you'll still be full of reservation and doubt. You'll still think you can do it another way. And I encourage you that if you struggle with that, you really need to look back on what brought you to where you are in the first place. And you really probably should spend some time contemplating that, contemplating the things that you did every time you compromised your own values and your own principles. Every time you cut your own throat with your own hand, just ask yourself if you want to do it again. I don't know about you, but there was nothing safe about slamming some drugs and some cocaine into my system from some guy, Flacco, that I never met, don't know where he got it from. And I used to think that knowing a guy like Flacco was the popular thing. Because I knew Flacco. He'd never hurt me. This is a drug dealer. He'd never hurt me. He'd never cut my throat. The displacement of morals, values, principles, completely altered, completely backwards, completely delusional, that's alcoholism. That's drug addiction. That's the lie that allows people to come back and say, I'm back. I relapsed. You relapsed because you didn't treat it. You relapsed because you weren't honest. You're shouting about your relapse and you should be thanking God you walked through the door. Because I don't know about you, but I go to one-bedroom places on Oriad Street, and I, I run around with drug dealers, and I, I don't care. It doesn't matter. I sleep in places that I, I don't know. Everything that was ever valuable to me that, that I, I held sacred when I was underneath the lash of drug addiction and alcoholism kept me not from doing it. Everything that meant the most to me, I walked away from it knowingly. If that's not a problem, then I don't know what is. 
I lived and carried that and just would continue to use to pack it all away and pretend that none of it was real. Just so that I could feel good at that moment. Selfishness. Self-centeredness. That, we think, is the root of our troubles. I think it's more important even still to talk about the next part of that where in the work they discuss that they make it very clear that you're not going to will it away. And in that, there's the, they're trying to point it out to you that you, this isn't something you just unthink or you unbehave by some good Samaritan acts to your neighbor or to your friend, or by lending money to someone, or by bringing food to the food pantry. Those things are great, but they don't change the man. They don't change the woman. That's been my experience. The actual work, the yielding, the invitation of something greater than myself is actually what changed me. All I did was walk through the work. I followed my sponsor's instructions, and the work changed me. God threw it changed me. All I did was follow instructions. So what can I actually claim? What can I say I did? I handed myself my own ass. What can I claim? Seriously? What can I claim? The five notebooks that are sitting in my car full of delusional thinking? Do you want to see them? I, who am I going to show them to? to at the rooftops? Look at what I did. I didn't do anything. I, I, I broke myself. I fractured almost every relationship that meant anything to me. What did I do? You know what I did? I broke trust that I'm still earning back 20 years later. People around me that were close to me are scarred from the way that I behaved. Still. People I love, scarred. Can I blame them when they doubt or when they fall into fear because they maybe see or hear or smell something that transports them back to 20 years ago? Can I get upset and say, well, I've been sober, you shouldn't feel like that. Are you kidding me? You kick a dog long enough, he's going to remember it. I mean, so, on a later note, um, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, baby. Um, third step is profound, man. Like, I wanted a relationship with God. I wanted to aspire to be more than what I was, and that's why I did it. I didn't think it was going to work. Until I found myself writing for two years, and I was still writing, and I hadn't quit. And the only variable was that I had a five-subject notebook, a pen, and a third-step prayer that I recited more times than I cared to count. And a sponsor who encouraged me. And a step-study meeting with people who had done it. That bore tes testament to what I was doing. And the hope that I might get to speak about it one day. That's what I did. It was the best thing I ever did. I still write inventory today. I have several notebooks at home. They're all over the place at my house. It's jammed up, write some inventory, get afraid, write inventory. And, um, I do it because I'm usually if I get in pain, then I, I write it and I know that it works and I know that God will reveal truth to me if I'm doing my part. And this is an act of the free will. The third step is an act of your own willpower. You're either going to change the person you brought in here or you're not. It really comes down to it being that simple. You're either ready or you're not. There isn't anything that I can say or anybody else can say or do that's going to be the instant, you know, magic bullet. There isn't one. There's just a commitment. 
to changing and an alignment of the will to do so and a little bit of faith that it might work. That's it. It comes down to those things. If you're not going to change, if you're adamant, if you have the attitude that will defeat you that the book talks about, which is intolerance and belligerent denial, if you walk around with that attitude and you insist on maintaining that attitude, you are not going to leave room for God. Period. Don't take my word for it. Try it. That's just the way it is. Don't know why it works like that. Don't really care why it works like that. It's none of my business why it works like that. I just know that it does. Because I have enough scars to show that I tried it and it didn't work like that. I'm really, really thankful to be here. I'm looking forward to hearing other people. And I thank you for letting me share. Thank you.